Well, hello everyone. It's Dr. Tom O'Brien, and uh, uh, I'm trying a microphone here, and I hope it works. Um, can you, anyone out there who's watching this, just text me and say, yes, it's working. I can hear you fine, uh, if you can. Um, so, hello. Uh, today's talk is, what is the single most important thing you could do for yours and your family's health? What is that single most important thing? Oh, hello guys, thank you for being here. Can you type a message to tell me if you're hearing me okay? I just wanna make sure before I get into this that, uh, uh, let's see, wanna know who I to swipe left to see your viewers. All right, I guess I have to swipe you. Oh, look, uh, oh, my, my wife's here. Hi, honey, hi, honey. Can you hear me okay? Is this microphone working? Oh, I sound great. Thank you, Tina. Okay, here we go. Here we go. What's the single most important thing you can do? Well, um, uh, I'm gonna start by saying, look at my eyes. Look at my eyes, look under my eyes. You see the bags under my eyes? I'm writing my next book now. And thank you, Lorraine, for letting me know. Uh, I'm writing the next book and there's a deadline, so I'm up like late every night until I'm just brain dead. This is what happens. <laughs> I'm remembering one time, we had our summer place, and uh, we're sitting out on the porch, you know, and having some wine with friends, and and uh, um, uh, they came back, and we had been, I think we'd gone through two bottles of wine for four people or something over a number of hours, and my daughter comes home, and she's about nine or ten years old. I say, Kelly, come here. Look at my eyes. You see how my eyes look because we've been drinking wine? Don't ever do this. <laughs> like that. So look at my eyes here and about sleeping. Um, I haven't been sleeping as much, but I've got to get this done. But it's so very exciting to be writing this book. It's really exciting. Uh, the book is um, uh, the working title. I'm not sure it's the final title yet, but the working title is What's Wrong With My Brain and How Do I Fix It? Uh, a simple once a week protocol to arrest brain deterioration. So that's what we're doing. And uh, um, it's really great. And so what I'm talking about today is a message in that book. And what is the single most important thing you can do? If there's one system of the body that's more important than any other system, and I'm writing about brain health here, but that one system, it's your gut. It's your gut and the microbiome in your gut. I'm going to give you a few pearls here about how to help your microbiome along. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you, Karen Stone. Thank you. Excited about a new book. Thank you. You know, I just got word that um, this book, uh, some of you have it, I think, The Autoimmune Fix. It came out about 10 months ago, and it's sold over 25,000 copies so far. It's like, yes, yes. And I just signed the contract. It's going into Polish and German. So hopefully more of the world can hear this information, you know, and we can stop this craziness going on in the world right now. Um, but I'm going to talk about the gut here. I'll take about 10, 12, 15 minutes at the most. To, and hopefully you get a couple of pearls that you haven't heard before that will help. Uh, hello from Tokyo. Oh, Negi Yuki, thank you so much. Oh, Ohio. Um, okay, gut health. Why is the gut most important? And some of you have heard this before. Hello, Twila. Some of you have heard this before, um, uh, but I, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page here. And you know, that is that um, uh, there are 10 times more cells of the bacteria in your gut than all the cells in your body put together. If you add up all your muscle cells, bone cells, skin cells, organ cells, brain cells, add them all up, there's 10 times more cells of good bacteria in your gut than that number. And that bacteria has 100 to 150, depending on what study you read, 100 to 150 times more genes than the human genome. And what we know about genes is genes control function. Genes turn things on, make more enzymes, make less enzymes contract this muscle, don't contract this muscle. Genes control how our bodies work. And hello, Mariana, thank you. And so when you have 100 to 150 times more genes than the human genome, and there's 10 times more of them than the human cells, usually it's after like the second glass of wine where uh, 
we'll start talking about, are we humans with a whole lot of bacteria or are we bacteria having a human experience, right? <laughs> it's really true. It's really true. There's more of them. They send more controlled messages out. So who are we really? And that's, you know, and that's, I think you understand why it takes a couple glasses of wine before uh, you can dive into that kind of philosophical conversation because the more science you look at, the more it seems to suggest we're a walking bacterial bombshell, right? Hopefully good bacteria, good bacteria. So we want a healthy microbiome because it controls so much function. You've heard me say for every one message from the brain going down to the gut, there are nine messages from the gut going up to the brain. Uh, good evening, Robin Durbin. Uh, so the ratio is nine to one, nine to one. The bacteria in the gut are sending nine messages up to the brain to talk about what the brain's supposed to do. And the term is modulate. Modulate means you've got your hands on the steering wheel and which way the car's going. And it's the bacteria in our gut that modulate brain function. How much neurotransmitters you make, uh, which genes turn on in the brain, which functions are turned on, which are turned off. That's modulated by the gut. Hello from Norway. Uh, is that Mona? Mona. Hello, Mona from Norway. Thank you so much. Thank you. So it's the bacteria in the gut. Uh, you know, this is very cool. Tokyo, Norway. Uh, here's Sydney, Australia. Uh, good evening. Manuela. Hello. Oh, that's really great. Um, um, so um, the modulation of brain function, that's what I'm writing about right now. The modulation of brain function is controlled by the bacteria in the gut. Certain bacteria have more influence on brain function than others, but they're all kind of the good guys, and it's the ratio of the good guys and the bad guys that's so important. You guys have heard me speak before. Hello from Michigan. Hey, Penny. Hi. You've heard me speak before that um, uh, in terms of weight gain and obesity, uh, it's, I call it the Pima Indian syndrome, that it's the ratio of the bacteria in your gut that hoards calories, save every calorie you can from cultures that didn't have much food to the bacteria that says use calories efficiently but don't hoard them. And it's the ratio of those two that has so much modulation, hands on the steering wheel, of whether you gain weight or not. And it's so common in obesity that these people are from... Elena from Ireland. Oh, how, so, how cool is this? Hello, Julie. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's so critically important that the ratio is called bacterioides to firmicutes ratio, bacterioides to firmicutes, that that ratio is critically important. Uh, Julia Pokorski, you're the best. Love you. Oh, thank you, Julia. Thank you. My wife is Polish, so I can accept that. I know what it means to be loved by a Polish woman, and it's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, um, it's the ratio of bacterioides to firmicutes that determines whether you, um, it has its hand on the steering wheel, it modulates, there are other controls, but this is a modulator, do you get obese or not in your life? So maintaining a healthy ratio of bacterioides to firmicutes, a couple of the families of bacteria in your gut, maintaining a healthy ratio is critically important. So there's the gut modulation uh, to the brain, and there's the gut modulation to the heart. We know now that atherosclerosis has a really strong component from the bacteria in your gut. You have too much of the wrong bacteria, they can predict now. Scientists can predict whether you're at higher risk for cardiovascular disease, for myocardial infarctions, and even mortality with a myocardial infarction. That's a heart attack. Yelena, thank you for your presentation during Autoimmune Conference in London. Oh, thank you, Yelena. That was a lot of fun. That was, I love talking to that group of nutritionists. They're just the best. Uh, they're so wicked smart. Uh, it's really great to be amongst that crowd. That was a really funny thing, guys, you know, for that event. I, um, I was lecturing in Portland on Thursday to another nutrition group. Then I had to go straight to the airport for my lecture get on a plane, fly to London. I landed at 12.10. My wife was there and we rented, she'd rented the car ahead of time, picked me up, drove into town, changed my clothes in the car to go on stage at two o'clock and I got there at 2.05. 
So that's like, zoom, zoom. And I don't ever want to do that again, but it was fun and we made it and it was great. Thanks, Elena. Hi, Missy. Uh, will you tell us more about lipopolysaccharides? Yeah, I'll do a whole Facebook Live on that. LPS is critically, critically important. But Missy, the mechanisms of how LPS gets into the bloodstream is all about intestinal permeability. So what I'm going to talk about here is healing the gut, having a great environment of your gut so it directly relates to LPS and LPS toxicity, which the end stage of LPS toxicity is septic shock, and that's what killed my mother. So I know this one really well, and we will talk about it, but it's not a you know, little three-minute answer here. You're welcome. Oh, thank you so much. It's so great when you guys type answers and you send little hearts, and it keeps me kind of fueled up. Not kind of. It keeps me fueled up so that I do this. Um, so there are so many studies now. The most common topic in new literature, new research literature being, oh, thank you, new research literature being published is on the microbiome and its effect across every system of your body. Every, your skin, uh, your energy, your thyroid, your heart, your brain, your gallbladder, your liver, that the microbiome has a direct modulating effect, having its hands on the steering wheel. I've never thought about that for the term, for the word modulating, but it's really a good one. You know, there's a whole lot of things that have to happen for the car to go forward, but what, who's got their hands on the steering wheel? That's your bacteria. And I think that's a pretty good analogy. Uh, Cheryl, Cheryl Bryan, you are awesome. Glad I caught you live. Oh, Cheryl, thanks. Just put an O in front of your last name, would you please? And then you're a cousin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so um, there's so much you can read about this. Um, I've got a full chapter in the autoimmune fix in this puppy um, about the microbiome. Uh, but I just want to talk about a few things that you can do. I'm going to talk about a couple of food habits that really help, and then I'm going to talk about some nutrition that really helps. And the two together are nice one-two combination that make a huge difference, a huge difference. Jeez, you have your maze. Oh, thank you, Jeez. Thank you. Um, so first, uh, the foods. Um, I did a whole YouTube video on applesauce and why an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Bottom line, it takes you six to eight minutes to make applesauce. It's really simple this way. Cut up some apples, dice them up a bit, throw them in a pot, add water, about one-third the apples, throw in some cinnamon, throw in a few raisins, boil it, and when the skin of the apple starts to get a shine, it's done. It's done. And what that means is that the pectin from the apples has been released to the outside and it's accessible to your digestive tract early in the digestive process. That pectin stimulates a hormone in your gut called alkaline, uh, alkaline phosphatase. Alkaline phosphatase. And when you increase alkaline phosphatase, intestinal alkaline phosphatase, I-A-K, when you increase intestinal alkaline phosphatase, you heal the gut, you feed the good bacteria, you kill the bad bacteria. So applesauce has a direct role to play, and I think the YouTube video is what to do with after antibiotics, and I talk about it in a lot of detail. Um, I love the applesauce, so delicious, great, thanks Brittany, thanks so much, thanks Betsy, mm, yeah, I agree, I agree. Uh, so you can go to the YouTube video to get more explanation about that, but that's the bottom line on it, and that really helps. The other food thing, Raw apples, yeah, just cut them up, cut them up, throw them in there, water about a third the height of the apples in the pot, bring it to a boil, boil it for six to eight minutes. As soon as the, the skin starts to shine, that's it, it's done. It's, it's a no-brainer. You can have your kids help you with it. They can squirt some cinnamon in there and throw a few raisins in there. And, uh, 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 oh, wait a minute, what is this? This is a guy. This is the first guy. Thank you, Walter. Thank you so much that yours is the best advice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is the skin on the apple critical here? No, uh, uh, I don't think so. There's pectin in the meat, but there's more pectin just inside the skin of the apple. So organic apples, guys, uh, they're pretty easy to find for most fruits. Uh, organic apples are the best. Uh, my wife is saying cooked, stewed apples, unpeeled. Well, my wife is saying unpeeled, and I'm going to disagree with that until I do a little more research. I'll let you know next week, but my understanding is the pectin is just inside the the uh, skin, um, right where it meets the uh, meat of the apple. 
So there's some, there's some pectin in the meat, there's some pectin in the skin, but right on that layer in between, and so I just leave it on there. Just get, if you don't have organic apples, then um, peel them. Uh, but if you, if you can, get organic apples. Okay? That's the apples. The next thing is fermented vegetables. Go to the local store, um, health food store, natural food store. Do you have to use raisins? No, absolutely not. That's just for a little bit of flavor, you know, just to add a little kick. There's no th I'm sure there's therapeutic benefit to raisins, but this is just for flavor. You don't have to use them. The cinnamon has therapeutic benefit. Uh, raisins, I'm unfamiliar with what the therapeutic benefits are of raisins. Um, uh, fermented vegetables, just make sure they're not pasteurized because pasteurization kills the bacteria. So you want to go to the store, get five different types of fermented vegetables. Get, uh, you're welcome, Penny. Get um, uh, uh, bok choy fermented. Get kimchi. It's a uh, Korean fermented vegetables. There's many different flavors of it. Uh, kimchi, uh, sauerkraut, uh, fermented beets. Just get four or five different types. And every day you have at least a forkful of one of the types because when the vegetables ferment, they produce bacteria, and it's the good bacteria that your gut needs. And there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different species of lactobacillus or bifidobacterium. So every vegetable will produce a different species of the good bacteria. That's why you want to um, vary the vegetables that you eat. And just you know, some people have said, well, can I eat more than a forkful? You sure can. Uh, I'm happy if you get a forkful and just a little inoculation every day in the long term. Remember the premise is base hits win the ball game. Base hits. Keep try stop going for home runs. You know, get base hits. Just keep doing the little things and in six months you've made such a huge difference. Oh, all these hearts just came by. Thank you so much. It's so cool when they float across. So you want to catch my attention, put a smile on my face, keep sending the hearts. What's this? How about if one has um, SIBO, SIBO, that small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? You have to take that um, uh, in baby steps. So in terms of fermented vegetables, you might only be able to do, you know, my friends over at um, SCD, um, uh, Jordan was so sick, um, he couldn't take fermented vegetables. He had to just do the juice of fermented vegetables at first and just a little spoonful of the juice in salad dressing. All he could do. And a few weeks later, I don't know the time frame, he tried a couple of threads of sauerkraut and it was fine. Yeah, kombucha can be beneficial also in that way. Um, I don't know the bacterial counts in there and what bacteria there are, but the premise of kombucha is that it works. So he could only take threads. And then after a few more weeks of just a couple threads every day, and then a couple threads twice a day, then he got it up to like a quarter of a teaspoon and just built it up, built it up, built it up. So you may have to do it very slowly if you have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. No, not Jordan Rubin, um, the SCD guys. Uh, I'm not remembering his last name. Uh, so fermented vegetables, a forkful, a forkful. Um, um, applesauce, really simple things, and of course vegetables, because vegetables in general, the fiber in vegetables, Mrs. Patient, the fastest growing cells in your body are the inside lining of your gut. Every three to five days, depending on the study, you have a whole new lining to your gut. The fuel, yeah, reasoner, thank you, Amy. The, the fuel to rebuild the um, uh, new cells in your gut is a uh, short-chain fatty acid called butyric acid, butyrate. How do we make butyrate? Well, if you don't have enough butyrate, you make your house out of straw instead of brick. And you see there are many, just Google low butyrate, low butyric acid, and colon cancer. And boom, here come the studies. Because you're making your, your house out of straw. You're making your new cells out of this lousy material if there's not enough of the good uh, butyric acid. How do you get butyric acid? It's the action of the good bacteria in your gut on vegetable fiber. That's how you make butyric acid. So you have to eat vegetables. You don't eat vegetables, you don't make butyric acid. You don't make butyric acid, you increase your risk of colon cancer and just colon dysfunction in general. That means gut pains, um, 
uh, irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel diseases. You have to have butyric acid. It's a basic 101 concept for any gastroenterologist, but they don't talk about how do you get more butyric acid. Eat vegetables. Have good bacteria in your gut that will then feed on the good vegetables. Hello from the UK. That is uh, Sat Mirakar. Okay, hi. I'm not sure I said that right, but thank you so much for joining. Uh, so that's the fermented vegetables, why you want fermented vegetables and why you want uh, uh, to eat vegetables themselves. So you do the fermented stuff to inoculate more of the good bacteria because our lifestyles have wiped out so much of the good bacteria. For example, GMO foods, one of the big dangers of glyphosate that's in GMO uh, products is that it kills the good bacteria. It just wipes out the good bacteria. So uh, uh, that's why you want GMO-free is because of the impact on the good bacteria in your gut. And the way Monsanto got around all this is they published and made claims and told the government um, uh, glyphosate has no effect on the uh, human body. Well, the bacteria in your gut's not human. That's how they got around it. And the uh, FDA people that looked at this, they knew that, but they said, okay, I guess you're right about that. And so they let it on the market. Uh, so it doesn't kill human cells, it kills bacterial cells, it wipes them out. So that's why you want uh, organic foods, guys, and not GMO foods. Okay, that's the food thing. Now the nutrition thing. If there's only one piece of nutrition, only one, I think um, there are a couple that are great, but if there's only one piece of nutrition you're going to use, it's colostrum. The first three days of mother's milk, mother's breast milk after a birth, it's not milk, it's colostrum. Why? Because babies in utero are all, they've all got leaky guts, big time leaky guts. It's normal when they're inside mom because they're sitting in this, this uh, sea, this ocean of juices, mom's juices, and they're just, you know, everything's going everywhere through the mouth and the nose, the um, uh, umbilical cord and the gut. I mean, everything's just going everywhere so this baby can grow. When baby is born, those very permeable intestines have to start to heal. How do they heal? It's colostrum, the first three days of mother's milk, three to five days of mother's milk, that turns on the genes in the gut. It says, okay, genes, let's close up those tight junctions now. That's the space between the cells. Let's close up those tight junctions and let's start building the receptor sites. Those are like catcher's mitts. For the good bacteria, mom's breast milk is going to be giving you good bacteria. So let's get the receptor sites ready. Here's the blueprint of the mammal that's going to be feeding you. That's mom. And colostrum is giving those messages that is preparing baby's gut, healing the permeability, setting it up so the good bacteria will thrive there. That's all done by colostrum. And humans can take colostrum any time in our life, any time. Now, I'll get to how often. Um, uh, but when your gut's not working right, when you've got intestinal permeability, when you've got SIBO, when you've got dysbiosis, meaning not enough of the good bacteria, too much of the bad bacteria, when you've got any type of gut problems, uh, inflammatory bowel diseases, irritable bowel, GERD, heartburn, when you've got any of that stuff, take colostrum because it turns on the genes to heal. Now, what about that it comes from dairy, that it comes from a cow? Mrs. Patient, here's what I recommend to you. You've been allergic to dairy for probably a long time. We just found out, so we're going to get dairy out of there, all the milk, all the cheese, all the yogurt, get it out of there. But for a couple of months, I'd like you to take this colostrum, as long as you don't have any pain or discomfort. It's worth a try. To, so those dairy antibodies may stay elevated for a couple of months, but you know it's a clinical decision, and I believe that turning on the genes in your gut to heal the permeability is so important that I'd rather you have this little dairy product if it's gonna cause any um, immune reaction. You've, it's been that way for years. Let it do it for another couple of months. As long as you don't feel bad, when you're, if you get any symptoms, just stop right away. But about eight out of 10 people can do that, that have a dairy sensitivity. They can take it for a couple of months with no problem at all, and they accelerate the healing of the gut, and they accelerate building the receptor sites for the good bacteria uh, by using the colostrum. Now, what about colostrum? Probably any colostrum is better than none. Probably, probably.
but there's one that head and shoulders is better than all the rest. My friend Andrew Keach, whose book is not there right now, and I didn't think to pull it out so I'd have access to it. His book is called Peptide Immunotherapy. Peptide Immunotherapy. And it's all about colostrum. And uh, Andrew was a, uh, uh, he was born and raised on a dairy farm in New Zealand. And he learned right away as a little kid doing his chores. If you don't give those newborn calves colostrum, they die within a week. You can't give them milk. They die within a week. So, and then he learned that the, the ranchers and the farmers, the dairy farmers, they, if they got sick, they took colostrum and they felt better. So there was a real health benefit to taking colostrum for humans. So he decided he was going to make the, uh, devote his life to carrying the message about colostrum out to the world. And he went and got a PhD in mechanical engineering at Oxford. And I said to him, Andrew, PhD, Oxford, I go, I got it. Way to go, man. Way to go. High five to you. Way to go. I get it. But mechanical engineering, what? What? And he said, well, Tom, I knew that I was going to make the best colostrum in the world. And uh, uh, no one in the world was doing it. But in order to do it, I was going to have to learn how to build the equipment. So he spent eight years, eight years getting a PhD to build the equipment to make colostrum. His colostrum is the best in the world. Grass-fed, prerequisite, grass-fed, no antibiotics, no growth hormones. He checks every batch. Two fellas, two ranchers try to slip some sick cow colostrum in with all the colostrum they sent him. And he, uh, he tests every batch, 43 different tests. And he said, I'll never buy from you again. And they said, oh, I'm sorry, sorry, it was a mistake. It probably was, I understand, but I'm sorry, you're the example, so everybody knows. You send me bad stuff, I never buy from you again. And his is the very best. You'll find it on our website, it's called GS Immuno Pro. GS for gluten sensitivity, Immuno Pro. It is the best colostrum in the world. I take it in every smoothie, just put a scoop in there. Uh, uh, some people, Andrew, <laughs> takes an 8-ounce glass. Oh, I don't have an 8-ounce glass. He, he puts an 8-ounce glass of powder, puts some water in it, and, uh, or shakes it up, and then he just drinks it down. I said, 8 ounces, Andrew, a day? And this guy is built like a tank. He's just as solid as can be, right? I said, it's a little much. Now, some people ask, uh, uh, Penny on my website, thedr.com, thedr.com. Uh, that's, um, you get any colostrum guys is better than none, I believe, for this purpose, but this is the best in the world. Uh, it's hands down, no, no question. And then there's a spray. Andrew extracts the proline rich polypeptides. It's the uh, uh, GSPRP spray. Uh, I forget the name, I'm sorry, I'm not good with that, but it's the spray. You'll see it in there for, from the colostrum. It's called PRP spray, proline rich polypeptides. And the Journal of Alzheimer's Research talks about how these peptides arrest the progression of Alzheimer's. I mean, it's remarkable to see what this stuff does. It's all in Andrew's book. It's, um, it's going to be in my new book in a lot of detail, uh, but you'll see some information on my site about it, thedr.com. Uh, the other thing that I would recommend you consider to have the healthiest gut possible, you have to heal the permeability that's there. And there's nutrition... Uh, can you get that from New Zealand? Um, I'm not sure um, if it's available in New Zealand. I'm not sure. I'm sorry. I can't help you with that one. I'm not sure. Um, you have to heal the gut. Colostrum, if you're only going to do one thing, that's the very best. There's nothing better than colostrum. Nothing. Uh, it's the only, uh, you know, <laughs> Andrew says there are many one-note players to heal the gut. Uh, only colostrum plays the entire symphony. And I said, oh, that's good. That's a nice analogy, Andrew. And I agree with them. I agree that's true. But there are thousands of studies, literally, on the benefits of glutamine, the benefits of vitamin D, the benefits of um, the essential fatty acids, um, the benefits of uh, curcumin. Uh, there are many, many different components can be really helpful uh, for um, uh, healing the gut. And I do believe all roads lead to Rome. Uh, there are many good approaches to lead to healing the gut. It's called a pleiotropic approach, good Scrabble word, P-L-E-I-O, pleiotropic. And we put together these packs. They're called the Gluten Sensitivity Packs, GS Packs. Uh, they're on the website. 
Um, the GS packs have 22 different nutrients in them. Every single one has got studies how it helps to heal the gut. So when you want to heal permeability, um, taking the GS packs along with the colostrum is a more potent than just giving the colostrum. If you're going to do one thing, just take the colostrum. But Mrs. Patient, can you take one pack a day? There's six pills in there, 22 nutrients, but it's one pack. Can you take one pack a day? And everybody can take one pack a day. Guys, keep a handful in your briefcase or in the glove box of the car. Uh, ladies, in your purse. And you just take one pack a day for two months. It takes a minimum of two months. So what I recommend always, you do the test to find out, do you have permeability? It's called the Wheat Zoomer Test. You do that one. Oh my gosh, I've got this. What do I do? You take colostrum, the gluten sensitivity packs. You feed the good bacteria with applesauce, fermented vegetables, lots of regular vegetables. And you go back in three months and you check again. You go, oh, look, I feel better and now my test results say I'm better. Okay, guys, I promised that I wouldn't keep this over 20 minutes. I have no, no idea how long it's been, but I think, yes, Manuela, it would be good for ulcerative colitis also. Yes, yes, just take baby steps, man. Just do it slow. Uh, uh, Manuela, I'm sorry, I don't know if that's a guy's name or a woman's name. I'm sorry, but just take baby steps. Thoughts on Restore product for leaky gut. Um, lots of people are talking about Restore. Um, I don't have enough personal experience with it. I've seen one study that showed that it really helped in test tubes to heal the gut, but that was in a test tube. Um, and I don't quite understand the mechanisms, and I uh, have to say, I just haven't researched that one strong enough to give you a strong opinion. Um, lots of people are talking, about, I'm at 30 minutes. Thanks, Penny, thank you so much. Uh, I need you with little cue cards. Uh, so, <laughs> Penny, you got a job next week. You can cue me every few minutes. Actually, that's a good idea uh, to do that. Um, so, guys, thank you so very much. I'm sorry I went over again, uh, but please send me uh, comments. I, I look at all the comments. I try to answer the ones that I can, and uh, uh, wish you much happiness and success, and see you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.